out the order at 6.01. Are there any adjustments to the agenda? I need to add an executive session for personnel. Um, has somebody got a radio on? Oh, there it goes. There it goes. Good. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, do you need an motion to uh, add the agenda, change the agenda? Nope, I'm just going to add an exec. We just need to add an exec executive session. So we'll do that right after other. Perfect. All right, and it's for personnel. Anything, anybody else need any changes? Um, is there any public comment? All right, hearing no public comment. We'll act to approve the minutes of Monday, February 22nd. Can I get a motion? Uh, I would make a motion to approve the minutes. Do I have a second? Second. Is there any discussion on the minutes? Hearing no discussion, so moved. Wednesday, February 24th, we have minutes. I don't know if we have minutes there. It's crossed down on my on uh, my agenda, Christy crossed out and put NA. So kind of that's an NA, not applicable. What did we have? Wrong. What was that meeting? I don't think there was one, but. Did we move a meeting? If there was a meeting, I'd have taken minutes. Yeah, I don't, I don't it was a Wednesday too. That's unusual for the full board. I, yeah, I don't know if that was. I was supposed to or... be the evaluate. It was supposed to be. I think there was one that's scheduled right. for the evaluation committee. Mm -hmm. Oh, and then we, got you got it. So that no, meeting was postponed. Yeah. There were minutes for that meeting, but that meeting was held off to. Okay. And the committee would have to be the one to approve those minutes, yeah. anyways. Right. So we can cross the five point two off. There was not a meeting that night. Okay, so we are on to reports to the board, Jamie. Uh, good evening. Um, you have my report in hand. Um, you know, I try to bring you up to date on a bunch of things. I have a meeting on Thursday to get an update with the VSA on the workings of the legislature currently. Um, one of the things that note for me right now is there's a lot of momentum to do uh, universal free meals um, for all students in the state of Vermont. Um, which is, you know, I think a great initiative. Um, one of the things that I have provided feedback on is I'm very concerned that it's an initiative though that's not coming with funding, um, which I know a lot of different superintendents have spoke out against. Well, not out against, we approve of the work they're doing, but have said that Montpelier is really difficult when it's an unfunded mandate. Um, and so that's something that we've been communicating back um to the legislature and so that's something i'm keeping an eye on closely um there hasn't been a lot of movement other than of course the legislature um you know continues to look at how they're going to dole out federal money that's coming into montpelier um in regards to covid relief efforts uh we're currently working very hard on a recovery plan efforts for esser two um, and I noted in my report some of the areas of focus that we'll look to leverage those monies for. Um, and then I was contacted by um, some representatives in Ripton. Uh, I've been contacted by them twice. And I don't know if you know, but they did decouple um, from um, Addison Central. And so I've reached out to Donna Russo Savage. I haven't heard back to get a sense of what the agency's thinking. Um, but it did make sense since they reached out to us. I'm going to go and I've been invited Kathy to join me just for an informational session with those folks on Wednesday night at five o'clock um, just to hear what thoughts they have um, and what they're hearing from the Agency of Education around drawing a boundaries for their supervisory union. 
I don't know how much choice we're going to have in this. As you know, the agency has a lot of control over the boundaries of the supervisory union. And really, I do work at the leisure of the agency of education under statute. Um, and one of the things um, that I think is going to lead the agency to consider WRVSU is that Ripton uh, broke off because they want to be a standalone district with school choice and every other supervisory union around them for the most part, other than Rutland Northeast are all supervisory union districts. And we are adjacent to them. And we do have a lot of students from Granville Hancock that do attend Ripton. Um, so I think those are all points that they may make um, in front of the state board when they go in front of them very soon um, to articulate what supervisory union they hope to join. Don, you have a <clears throat> I, I did. Uh, how many students are we talking? Just under 60 is my understanding. Okay, thank you. Ethan? Kevin, I have a question. Yeah. Um, Jamie, just jumping back to the beginning of your report, what's the percentage of teachers getting in getting COVID shots? Uh, I'm going to do a I'm going to do a survey this week, Ethan, to gather that information. But by many your sense is a good majority, or yeah, my sense is that definitely a majority of our teachers are um, accessing vaccinations via the program offered uh, by the agency of added Department of Health. A uh, good and second, just second thing, any reason for um, somebody from RVSU to be. Or our set, I mean, um, to be uh, with you in that meeting with Rip. I don't. I don't think so yet, Ethan. Okay. Because uh, they're very interested more in the umbrella of the SU. Gotcha. Um, and I'm going to do a lot of listening. Yeah. Um, really, and try to gather information about you know what their interest is and what their thoughts are. Um, you know, I haven't gotten. I haven't received any details from them. I'm also going to reach out to their current superintendent to gather some additional information too from Peter. Cool. Well, let, let me know if I can, you know, be of help or service in that. Thank you, Ethan. All right. Carl, you had your hand up. Yes, thank you. Um, as far as uh, uh, the Ripton uh, uh, situation goes, have we modeled what, you know, just in general? I mean, I don't think Tara needs to, to, to get into to, to serious uh, 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 detail at this point, but an overview of what that you know what that would do or how that would affect our uh, um, numbers and we have not yet Carl okay um, and certainly uh, it, it doesn't need to be done you know it, it, it's just something to be thinking about as you, as, as you move into uh, uh, looking at that <clears throat> and I did want to comment as uh, uh, someone with uh, school employment one thing, uh, speaking to Ethan's uh, uh, a comment about vaccination, um, I, to get vaccinated in the month of March, get my first shot in the month of March, I had to go to Hinesburg. Um, the, 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 the site has filled up pretty, pretty, pretty fast. So I think that, uh, you know, I, I would expect for, for, you know, a lot of our teachers will get vac vaccinated in April to uh, uh, beginning of May, just because of, the, the, the slot demands uh, in this area um, and with Rutland really being, they're not, they're not doing them in, uh, in, in Randolph. So it's like Rutland or Montpelier or, or like Hinesburg. So it's, I, I think there's a lot of, I mean, from what I've heard the everyone, all the teachers are around me and, and uh, everyone's like, Oh, when'd you get in? When'd you get in? Where are you going? So there is definitely a buzz and a positive, uh, momentum towards towards uh, the staff getting getting the vaccine. I know that a lot of our folks took advantage in Hartford um, this past Saturday, and uh, I do believe a great deal of at least our set. I was reported out to be that a lot of your folks have at least received one vaccine, and Johnson and Johnson was the one on hand in Hartford, um, and I know that was on hand in Springfield too. So some folks are. Um, having the, the one shot approach to vaccination as well. All right, anything else for Jamie guys? 
I, I had a question. Did, Sorry, I didn't know where the hand thing was. <laughs> Carl, you had your hand up first, so go ahead. Um, yeah, no, I just wanted to finish about the um, uh, the va the vaccine. What I what I was curious about is, especially as you're you're talking about people getting the the one shot, are we prepared and managing? I know we can't tell teachers when to go or not to go, or I don't think we can. Um, managing for subs and stuff because everything is the J and J vaccine will often knock you out for a day. And the second shot of the, the Pfizer or Moderna's can be also kind of problematic. So are, are, is, is that being controlled or? It is, and actually Carl, our teachers have been working with administration to manage when they're signing up. Um, it's been a very collaborative effort. To Excellent, thank you. Yeah, I, so I'm gonna lower hand. I just wanted to follow on that briefly. I know that at Harwood they're doing a full day where everyone's getting their second shot and then doing a remote day after so that those who have side effects can recover. And I wanted to know if, you know, on the sub front, if there was some, if there was some way to, again, like knowing that we cannot mandate vaccinations, I feel like if we can make sure that people are equipped to be able to take it if they need it, to take a day off if they need it. Um, and then also if, if you or our COVID coordinator are tracking the percentage of teachers who are of staffers who are vaccinated so that we can know when we've reached you know what we think is some magical herd percentage well as i mentioned in my report i do plan to survey my staff this week okay um to collect that that percentage and we'll continue to do that every two weeks and um you know stacy the the principals and staff have been doing a great job of maneuvering sub coverage and things all year um and uh, I don't see us having to go remote um, in order to get folks vaccinated. Awesome. That's great. All right. Thank you, Jamie. Um, 6.2, curriculum instruction and assessment. We have Amy. Hi, everybody. How are you doing tonight? Good. How are you, Amy? Great. Hey, Ray, would you mind um, pulling up that presentation, please? Amy, that's actually on the agenda. So this oh, was is. just a placeholder. So you can just okay. let folks know that you're going to present um, under the data report. Fantastic. We'll talk more uh, in depth about data. Did anyone have any specific questions around curriculum right now? If not, we'll continue the dialogue later. All right. All right, thanks, Amy. Um, Special Services Director. Good evening. Uh, you have my report. I just want to bring your attention that we have two new hires in the district. Uh, Tanya Rotowski is joining us at the high school to oversee our alternative uh, program there, classroom. Uh, she comes uh, from the past six years. She's worked for the state of Vermont in the a AOE. Our second hire is Annette Rhodes. Um, again, she will be overseeing the entire Wildcat Institute so that the three programs we run, uh, the three through five, the six through eight, and the nine through 12. Uh, she'll also oversee the uh, and support us and educate us more in the MTSS uh, uh, realm. So. Any questions on either of those hires? I'll just add they're both for next year and we're budgeted for, just so folks know. Uh, just want to announce there was two resignations uh, this year. Uh, Chris Smith, who was our team leader in the three uh, or the five through six uh, middle school Wildcat Institute. Um, and Donna Locke, who was a paraeducator in the Sharon School. So they are effectively resigned this year. I also put into my report, um, it came to my attention that we didn't have a, a process when uh, folks wanna use their personal vehicles to transport kids. So we came up with a process. Um, anyone have any questions on that process? It was pre pretty straightforward. Then my last thing, I just want to keep on adding to uh, each meeting, or hopefully to each meeting, uh, some updates from the AOE. Uh, this one was parentally placed students in non-public schools, including homeschool. 
and the proportionate share. That proportionate share comes from the uh, IDAB grant, uh, and it's calculated, and, and I, I won't go into the details of calculations because I have to figure that out, uh, it's a, the program. Uh, but we have this year roughly $4,000 in the proportionate shares that we can spend on uh, children who are not in our public schools for specialized instruction. That could be uh, direct services or that could be uh, uh, consultation or uh, contracted services to provide um, support to kids who, uh, who are parentally placed. Anybody have any questions on that? I, this is Don, I do. Um, is that um, statutorily required that the local school districts pick up those costs? Yes, it's, it's in the, it's always been there in the regs. It hasn't always been followed through by uh, local districts. Uh, the AOE has picked up on that and they're going to really, um, you know, be stringent of the rules this year, uh, starting this year. Uh, so that means uh, we have to have uh, consultation with uh, uh, private schools in our district uh, and have uh, consultation with each homeschool parent. So it's going to be very, and I haven't figured it out yet. I, would, I think there's a lot of us in the field that haven't figured it out yet, but it's going to be time consuming um, uh, to, to meet that uh, mandate. Will it be incumbent upon the parent to notify the school district, or is the school district going to be responsible for going out there and canvassing the countryside looking for these folks? Well, we have, it's called Child Find. And so when we put it out, we advertise to say if, if there's any student out there, child out there that uh, is suspected of having a disability to notify us because we have to uh, you know, locate them and uh, evaluate them. Um, so we'd also have a list of all our homeschool. Uh, folks, uh, and so we'll, we'll have to reach out uh, through letter or advertisement or email. Ethan? Okay, so putting that notice. Oh, 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 go ahead. So putting that notice in the paper covers us legally. Is the trial fine? Yes, legally putting it in the paper. Yeah, oh. and you know, okay. you, you, we you. want to make sure it's it's you know we do our due diligence to to find these folks. In the, in the children, so. And, and sorry, Don, this is specifically for special education programs for homeschool or private school students? Yeah, for, for instance, if I was a homeschool parent mm -hmm. and uh, I suspected my child uh, might have a disability of some sort, whether it be a specific learning disability or other, uh, it's the obligation of my school district to do a child find to see if my child has a disability. I mean, uh, $4,000 doesn't seem like a whole lot of money to do a whole lot, especially if you have, you know, 40 homeschool kids in a district. I mean, I mean, that's, that's 4,000 for the whole SU, correct? That's correct. Uh, yeah. So it isn't, it isn't a lot of money. Mm -hmm. And it's really, um, the, it's really up to the LEA how that district spends that money. But we try to do it in consultation with folks. Uh, so, for instance, if uh, we we have the conduct all these meetings and, you know, the majority of the kids uh, might have a, um, a specific reading disability, um, you know, I could choose to just to provide some kind of consultation to uh, folks for in reading. Okay. Yeah, so. and, and this this money, it seems a bit crude, but this money doesn't go to pay any of your salaries or services. It's to pay for specific materials. Well, that that um, that allocation of uh, of monies uh, can be used to pay for staff to to provide uh, direct instruction. Uh, for instance, if we if we in I think it's part of my presentation or uh, report is if uh, someone at uh, let's say a private school wanted to provide uh, direct services to students. Uh, we could pay them, but it would have to be off their working hours. It'd have to be sometime uh, outside their contracted hours. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Anything else, Don? No, nope, that that's it. All right. Thanks, Don. Yep. Thank you. All right. Business Manager Tara. Good evening, everyone. 
you have my report. I will entertain any questions that you have. If there isn't any, we'll move right to the revenue expenditure summary. All right, doesn't look like there's questions, Tara. Okay. So are you gonna put that, are you putting that one, the report up or? Just waiting for Ray. Okay. Thanks, Ray. So on the expenditure side of the report, the changes this month, we've increased the COVID cost up to 90,811. And then down in the potential areas of savings, we have about $26,354 projected in savings for contracted services and $7,411 in travel that haven't been allocated at this point. So I've added those on. So on the expenditure side, we're looking at a surplus of 296,220. And Ray, if you can move to the revenue page. Only change on the revenue side is just increasing the potential reimbursement to match the expenditure. Which brings us to a potential area of savings surplus of $78,519. I've updated the bottom fund balances to represent the final audits for the supervisor union for FY19 and 20. And those are the only changes that I made on that page. Any questions? Um, Tara, hi, Ethan here. Um, uh, just wondering if, if we have any better sense. I, I heard somebody say earlier that Montpelier's got some money for COVID money. If when, when we're going to be seeing money coming into us. We have been fully reimbursed for our CRF grant based on what I have submitted to date. And those payments will be going out to districts. You'll be seeing them in the warrants this week. Excellent. Thank you. And we just finalized our ESSER uh, 1 grant application, um, Ethan, on Friday. Yep. Go ahead, Carl. Um, hey, Tara. Uh, so H152, that's adjusting the um, yields, uh, uh, property tax equivalent yield to 11 grand 317. And um, is that something that we're, we're up, we're updating our, our, our budgets and calculations with? Do you think that's really maybe not going to happen? So you're leaving it, it, it where it is? Or where do we stand on on the, the, the machinations of, of Montpelier and the tax rate? I have not received anything on the final yield yet. Right, but we did Montpelier. use the 11,000, Tara. We used 11,385, which was the projection that was given to us back on March 1st. But I haven't seen anything final from AOE yet on what the yield was. So I can't answer that question, Carl. Thank you for your honesty about that. And uh, hopefully we'll get answers soon. All right. Any more questions for Tara? All right. Thank you. Um, Ray, Director of Technology. Hello, everybody. Uh, you have uh, my report, and I would like to entertain any questions that you might have. Um, as those are formulating, I just wanted to mention that uh, our PBT report wrapped up last week, uh, working on E-rate stuff this week, and then transitioning into SBAC um, very soon. Work, working was working on that right before the meeting. So <clears throat> to uh, support the work of the continuous improvement plan, so that's uh, something that talks about how we're going to use grant funds for next year. Am I getting this right, everybody? Uh, we have 
added some uh, characteristics to star so that the data can be viewed in a number of different ways to support that, uh, that work. Uh, SBAC, Project 10 million, uh, seeking some guidance from the food service folks at the state today about reaching out to our eligible families. Uh, in the PEBG report, I think there were 520 uh, eligible students who were sent in that submission. T-Mobile has offered us 110 hotspots. Now, T-Mobile coverage isn't the best in this area, but um, for what it can do to help our learners, we're going to try. And EC Fiber had a uh, big outage last week. Yes, they did. Ray, I don't know what Project 10 million is. Can you explain? Sure. So uh, T-Mobile back in September announced that they were going to offer uh, hotspots um, for families that are eligible for the National School Lunch Program. So we applied back in October, or November. The state recently approved uh, a contract, and so we're moving forward with that. OK, thank you. Sure. Don Shaw. Hi, I, uh, Don, I just had a question, uh, Ray, regarding uh, the solar issues. Have we got any more updates on uh, where we are for solar? I believe that's coming up later. Uh, I don't know if it's a separate. Uh, yeah, I think we're going to be able to give you a pretty decent update, Don, under the Energy Committee. Um, okay. We've had some meetings and uh, talked to you guys about our thoughts about how to move that work forward. Um, Stacy. Okay, thank you. Hi, Ray. I wanted to ask about EC Fiber outage and redundancy. Um, I mean, EC Fiber hasn't had very many outages. Um, I know this is kind of a bad time for outages because you've got the remote learning academy but i wanted to just ask in those districts where there are not like stockbridge doesn't really have any other kind of connectivity i'm assuming there are still landlines at the school at least um but i just wanted to ask what we had in place for redundancy when the primary internet service is down we don't nothing no, well okay essentially nothing i mean um you gotta understand that the service that ec fiber offers uh each of the schools is $72 a month and yeah. it's 700 meg service. So the next uh, cost effective option would be probably $600 a month. Yeah. You have to carry a lot of cost to get a layer of redundancy. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I... So in this case, fortunately, it was for a significant portion of their customers. So they responded very quickly. I think it was about 40 minutes. I don't remember the total. It depends on the town, different towns. Where I'm, I'm on the governing board, so I know ah. a little bit. Ah. Um, <laughs> yeah. So I'm, I'm just trying to figure out what we can do. Like, yeah. Our, our best hope is that EC Fiber improves their own redundancy. I would love that. No one would like that more than people involved with EC Fiber. Okay, thank mm -hmm. you. All right. All right, any more questions of Ray? Okay, thank, thank you, Ray. Um, policy committee, anti-racism policy. The policy committee is not meeting until Thursday this week, so I don't know if we have any update or anything to talk about tonight, Jamie. Well, I just wanted to lay out kind of where we're at in the process. So I've sent out a folder to all policy committee members um, across the SU today. And I've asked the feedback that folks have submitted. Um, you can either send it to me and I'll place it in that folder, or um, you can go ahead and directly place it in the folder. We've had our most community um, response in Stratford. Um, and so Aaron's the only member from the Stratford board here. Aaron, I've taken all the documents we had and placed in the SU policy committee folder. And Ray taught me how to do some nifty things around making that an easy thing. And then we didn't lose it in the other folder. But anyways, he was uh, bringing me up to the 21st century in technology today, coaching me. And, um, you know, the, the next step would be that the committee will meet and review that feedback. There's been some 
feedback that's really made it's made some pretty significant revisions to the policy. So I think the policy committee has just got to give some direction around um, what your, where, which direction they want to go um, before we create a third draft. Um, and so that's what we'll be digging into Thursday night. So all those on the policy committee, I sent that information I've received out to you today. Please review it um, so that you have some thoughts so we can get right to work on Thursday night. There was enough feedback. I didn't want to have a third draft for you until we discussed it. Okay. All right. Any other discussion on the policy committee? Okay. Um, negotiations committee. Um, we had a meeting last week. Um, I forget, was it Thursday night? Wednesday night? I don't remember which night. My Thursday night. Night. Um, we we're waiting to hear back from the support staff, but we had an initial meeting. Jamie shared some information with us um, to, to get us started. And that's all I got. Anybody else from the there that night have any input? Yeah, I'll just add that, you know, we were just starting uh, some preliminary work. Um, I expect that we're going to get an initial letter to negotiate, um, hopefully by the end of the week. And if not, then I think at our next meeting, which will be next Thursday, the policy committee is going to meet on the first and third Thursday. Then the policy committee can, uh, sorry, policy Negoti committee, negotiations committee can take up whether or not we want to actually initiate um, negotiations and send a letter to the support staff. So we can get this work underway. Any questions? Uh, yeah, I, this is Don. Can we legally ask to open it? I thought we had to get it from the the union. In order My to understanding, um, I put out another question with Dean around that is that we could ask to get moving is my yep. understanding okay all right um superintendent evaluation committee carl had his hand up Kathy. Oh, I'm, sorry. I'm sorry charles go ahead um no i was just going to say that the, the 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 contractual obligation we don't ever have to start negotiations we can the union has a particular deadline by by which they need to start them. That's 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 in the contract, but I believe that you know either side could you know can uh, agree to go into into negotiations. So yeah, I think that if we if it balances our time, we can we can try to ask to do that. They may <laughs> ignore us, but yeah, we can ask. Thank you, Carl. All right. Um, the next one was uh, Superintendent Evaluation Committee. Um, we've also we also have that meeting. Um, we worked with the VSBA. Um, we worked with Jamie um, in the meeting. We came up with some goals, which I think um, are later on in the. The evaluation goals are later on in discussion items to discuss, but does have it, anybody have any questions beyond that or anybody on the committee have anything to share? Um, I think it was generally felt, this is Ethan, um, generally felt that the, the money spent for the VSBA assistance was very much worth it, um, that the questionnaire was very useful and the feedback was very useful. And now we have a benchmark. Basically, the response we got this year is the benchmark that then we can really compare to in a year because obviously Jamie's so new, um, uh, but that we get to use, you know, their materials um, again next year. So uh, I think as I'm right, right, this was a one-time invest investment that um, really, I think, absolutely helped our process. Um, I think too, there was some discussion about how previous superintendent evaluations, basically nothing's happened with and I felt like we had a very concrete conversation with Jamie at the end of our last meeting. And as I say, his, his, um, his goals at the bottom of his superintendent report um, 
um, I, I feel very happy with those and feel like we made good progress. I just wanted to agree with what Ethan just said. I would concur with that. And we do have a plan that um, Jamie is going to report out on his goals at each meet of our full board meetings or every other. I'm not sure if we decided exactly which, but for us to keep up and, and make sure we're getting where we need to go with that. Anybody else? Okay. Um, so we're on to discussion items. WRVSU academic data report, winter 21. So Amy's gonna guide you through this data because her she has been digging into it mightily. Um, but I gotta say there's some real celebrations here um, that I hope we pause and just reflect on because even in the midst of a pandemic, um, we have some some pretty significant achievement data to celebrate when you when you think about the fact that um, we are in a pandemic and we've had one of our highest it's our highest um, in the last five years achievement in reading this past winter. So that's pretty significant and uh, something to pause over um, based on how hard our faculty, staff, students, admin have been working. So nice. I'll hand it over to you. Do you want to present the slideshow, Amy, or this first? I'd like the slideshow. Um, the, this report backs up um, what's in the slideshow. So you're gonna see um, quite a bit of overlay there. Um, I kind of wanted to ground our discussion tonight in just kind of reviewing the different types of assessment that there are um, and some of the purposes of those. You'll hear me refer a lot to STAR 360, which is our universal screener, and it's actually probably the most continuously used um, assessment that we ha have um, at our fingertips as we think about progress within our supervisory union. Um, in addition to that, there's, of course, diagnostics. Um, diagnostics are what you use um, following a universal screener to kind of give a deeper dive into what might be going on for a student. An example of this would be um, the PNOA or ENOA. And then you have formative assessments. An example of this might be an exit ticket that a teacher uses at the conclusion of a lesson to see um, kind of next steps for her, um, her work the next day with students. And then finally is summative, and this is um, some external measures such as SBAC. It can also be an internal measure um, that you might use within a supervisory union. Um, and then finally, um, one that's not on here uh, that we're not exploring is some performance tasks, and that would be somewhere that we might want to consider dialing up with a lot of our flexible pathway opportunities that we um, hopefully have on the horizon there. Hey, um, Amy? Is I'm, there a I'm, question? Yeah, Amy, I'm sorry. I don't mean to interrupt. Um, you're just at the beginning. Just some definitions, if you would. Um, I, 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 maybe you did this, but I, I don't actually know what a universal screener is. Is that a teacher? Is that what, it, or what is that? <laughs> Oh, I'm sorry. I thought I would. Do you mind going back a slide and I'll just repeat? Okay. Yeah, just, I just don't know sort of who's responsible for each one of these and what they and what they sure. are. Great. Thank the you. Universal, so much. When you see star 360 on your reports, that would be an example of a universal screener. It gives you a broad brush uh, kind of pass at how a kid is. Um, is progressing in, in proficiency across a lot of different areas um, and is benchmarked toward, um, you know, kind of where, where they are in comparison. Um, STAR 360 actually has one of the largest sample size of student progress um, available. So it's kind of a well-known tool in that sense. Um, a diagnostic ex example would be the PNOA or the ENOA. Um, also, the benchmark would be that's some of the different tests that teachers give to elementary. Okay, and so this is this is something we're use already. I've just never heard that. I've never heard those terms before. Yeah, so I'm just about them. that's where I, why I'm trying to ground this so that you kind of know each yeah. of the purposes um, of the assessments, because each different assessment, the universal screener will give you 
um, an eye on which kids need a deeper dive. And then at that point, you use a diagnostic. Okay. 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 So um, with the diagnostic, like if I were concerned about a student's literacy development, even though we use uh, the benchmark assessment system or some other tools to really analyze how a kid is doing, I might use that to really analyze a little bit more deeply what's going on for that student. Does that make sense, Ethan? Yes. So yes. far, a formative is just within a lesson cycle. So I teach a lesson that day, I give an exit ticket that's a little checkup. I see who got it, who didn't, and I um, group students so that I can reteach to the appropriate group, okay? Mm -hmm. And then the summative would, an example of that would be an SBAC, which is an external kind of assessment that might, um, it could also be an, an end of course um, assessment. So that would be the summative, yeah. Is it could be two, those are two examples of a summative. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay. Yeah. That and, makes and sense. Is it the teacher that decides this process, or is it teacher administrator, or is it you or the SU? Who decides a, what kids get this process? That's a great question, Ethan. So within our comprehensive assessment plan, we lay out kind of in general what tests are being deployed when at the universal screener, and for us, mm -hmm. some of the diagnostics. It also lays out when the summatives are happening. So there's a, a chart that shows, um, I believe Mary Ellen shared it with you at the beginning of the school year. And it will show you when each of these types of tests are being deployed. Now, of course, a teacher can choose to do a formative and we hope that uh, he or she is on a regular basis so that we're keeping an eye on keeping our education responsive. But um, that's really what we're going after um, is a little bit more alignment and it's sort of a requirement from the state as far as uh, how we align our assessments to make sure that we have a mix of assessments because we get a truer picture of when we use a variety of different types. Okay, it allows different types of kids to really show what they know. And, Jamie, and would you add anything else to that? Yeah, just that, you know, one of the things that we're going to look to do, Ethan, is to continue to strengthen our feedback loop um, and do further PD with teachers um, on th th these areas, you know, and the idea that, you know, when you get to a summative assessment, that doesn't mean we're done. Right, so if the student doesn't understand the concept, we don't get to just say, "All right, well, they didn't get it. We got to move them on." Mm -hmm. That should be a there should be a feedback loop that then says, "All right, how are we going to make certain that we once again teach that concept and skill?" The the idea of a feedback loop helps. The graphic of that might be useful. The idea that you know there's little ones and then there's bigger ones, sort of you know there's longer term ones and short term ones that are constant, hopefully feeding back. Now, is all this done uh, the same in all of our districts? The screener is and the diagnostic is. Okay. I think we got to do further digging into our summatives and better define what a summative is, Ethan. Mm -hmm. And formative, that's an area that I think we need to strengthen around just consistency of having different opportunities to use formative assessment in order to inform instruction. Okay. Good. Thank you so much. I really appreciate the clarity. Well, and I think that a lot of the data processes that we're setting out in the data teams will can further ensure some of that consistency between schools too. Okay, quick quiz, everybody. Let me see it in the chat. What do you think? Over the last six years, what has the average score been in literacy? Please put it in the, in the chat. All right, everybody, over the last six years, the average score in literacy has actually been C, 54. Our current, oh, can you go back one for me? Our current level um, is 60, so we, we are up. Our lowest was 49, and we're really shooting for that 80% 
um, of really making sure that our universal in instruction is strong. Ray, do you mind advancing now? So here is the, uh, <laughs> that's great, Stacy. Um, here is kind of the long-term view. And when I was saying that STAR 360 is the um, kind of most continuously used, this is what I'm talking about. So we were able to track it back to um, 2015. And um, this is what the progress has looked like in STAR 360 reading. So we're seeing a little uptick here, hoping that it will continue on that upward trajectory. As we examine uh, grades three through six in STAR, um, we can see here that um, our levels actually advanced uh, just slightly in the fall. We started out last winter, that was last January of 20 before shutdown, and we were at, were at 55% proficiency within STAR 360. Um, when kids came back, you can see there was a slight advancement to 56, and now we have the 60. Jamie, did you want to add on to that? Yeah, I just, I want the board to know. So when I, when you hear me talk a lot um, about our math work, and I'm, you're going to hear me talk about needing to continue to strengthen our um, primary grade literacy instruction. I also have some concerns in regards to our writing, explicit writing instruction as an SU. When we look to leverage those recovery funds, just know when I'm talking more about math and some other areas, it's because we have continued to show demonstrate growth. There's certain segments within our population that hasn't, but um, this is good news for us. And I do think our efforts to get students back um, to in-person instruction has um, played a role in regards to us continuing to grow and not trying to make up the difference to get back to where we were last winter. There's a lot of systems that are not back to where they were last winter yet. The um, other aspect that you'll see within the report is um, because we are using STAR 360, we can get a sense of, um, in general, how um, di other districts have responded nationally um, to shutdowns and uh, the COVID slide. So um, these are really results to be proud of, and I'm looking forward to continuing to see those develop. Ray, do you mind advancing? So then as we break out, you can see we only run STAR 360 in grades 9 and 10, not the full high school. And we have it broken out by 3, 5, 6, 8, and 9, 10. The upside is our participation rates of the number of students tested um, that are represented in those bar graphs. I feel pretty good that that's accurate in grades three through five and six through eight. Both of those are registering in at 61% proficiency. But as we look at grades nine and 10, one thing to just kind of keep in mind, even though they're registering in at 59%, uh, only 69% of the students that were in grades 9 and 10 were tested. And that's something we're working with teachers to improve so that we have a, a better view on all kids there. So um, you may see that number, you know, do some funky things going forward as we hopefully get some uh, more continuity in the number of kids being tested. John. Yeah, is the, is the disparity in grades 9, 10 because we have kids in so many school districts and we don't have that access to the data? No, I mean, grades 9 and 10, that's basically, um, we're only looking at uh, White River Valley High School there. Um, we don't have an ability to leverage STAR 360 in other sending schools. So um, that would just be the high school. And I think that... Traditionally, it's a little bit uh, more difficult to uh, motivate the high schoolers. There were some irregularities and attendance patterns that were also um, problematic in the winter. So, um, but that's something that I think the team there will be working on to tighten up the processes around that. Because it's, it's part of that universal screening um, that we need to do so that we have an eye on how kids are progressing. Right, thank you. Yep, thank you. 
Amy, just a quick question, Ethan. Um, uh, are these other processes going on, diagnostic, summative, and all that, even if you don't have a STAR 360? So you might have some information on those kids from other sources? That's a great question, Ethan. Yeah, I think um, ideally that there would be, in my perfect world, there would be formatives happening within the classroom. Um, but the STAR 360 does give us a great scan of um, kind of all of those high level proficiency skills that I think will, you know, once we really know how to use that tool, it will be really useful for teachers. Um, but I think there, there's still a learning curve there. Okay. All right. You want to take a look forward? All right, everybody. Here's your quick quiz. Over the last six years, what's the highest our math proficiency has been? Let me hear it in the chat. All right, A48 is the highest our math proficiency has been. Our current is actually C and the average is 42. 80 is again what we're shooting for, for universe for, to show strength in our universal. This is longitudinally how it looks and why there's some areas of concern in math. Ray, do you mind going ahead? So we look at um, grades one through six, you can see the dip from the COVID slide happening where we were at 45 and it dropped to 34. Um, this winter we are back up to 40. So they are rebuilding. And I think a lot of that is just having access to that face-to-face -face instruction. And as we think about achievement by level, we can see here that we have 20 that were um, proficient within grades one through six, 22 in grades seven and eight, and 35 in nine and 10. Again, uh, the participation rates at nine and 10 were a little problematic. Do you mind advancing? So the final slide that I kind of want to share with you is um, some of the work that Ray and I've been doing to um, get characteristics loaded within STAR 360, which gives us a better view on um, how students with um, varying challenges might be performing. Yes, Megan, do you have a question? She left the meeting, Amy. Oh, OK. So, um, Within that, we want to make sure that just a student having a certain characteristics doesn't predetermine how they're going to perform within our system. And that really calls for a really robust MTSS system. Um, so as we look at the next slide, as we disaggregated um, the results, you can see um, some of the difference that we have um, with our free um, reduced lunch, free lunch, and special ed students across all areas. So this is certainly something as we're really trying to build um, our MTSS system. We want to make sure that, um, you know, we're taking steps forward to continue to build uh, strength in the system as a whole. And I know that Don's been doing a whole lot of work um, in special ed to tighten up the systems there and to provide some additional training. So we want to make sure we give all of our students the opportunity for um, kind of to achieve what their hopes and dreams are. So are there any further questions? Jamie, would you like to add on to anything? Let me see Ethan's Ethan. question first and then. Uh, yeah, a couple things. Um, uh, first, is, is, is the reading increase, I mean, can we, despite Janie Feinberg, um, put this to Fontes and Pinnell? I mean, is, it, is, that, is that a specific reason? I mean, I'm just sort of wondering, obviously one, you know, reading's gone up, math's gone down. We don't have a math, a unified math program, but we do have a unified literacy program. Is that 
you know, because obviously you want to know why you're being successful so that you can keep doing it. I think that um, the key is really teachers working together for all kids. And I think that's what we're doing a better um, job of is really leveraging our teamwork within the system. Mm -hmm. I don't think you can um, say any program will sustain any um, type of growth over the long haul. Um, I, I think that it really comes down to the teamwork that's happening in buildings and how we're gathering around students to analyze their next needs and responding to those needs together. Great, thank you. Mm -hmm. Aaron? Yeah, Amy, is it possible and is there value in doing so to look at, not just at year over year how a graded group three to six is doing, but to say, you know, the class of 2024, how they're doing over the years? Yes, um, I didn't um, take a look at, at it uh, within your report by cohort, but have been examining that uh, kind of behind the scenes. So, you know, there's um, limits to, and certainly we're encouraging principals to make sure that they're looking at cohort growth also. Jamie, do you wanna add on to that idea? Yeah, just that I think we, we've got to get um, better as a supervisory union at examining individual student and cohort growth via scale score and measuring rate of growth um, across the school year. And so each one of these screening tools, STAR 360 and others, will project to you what a student should grow within three months. And I don't think we, I think we've been very caught up in if they're meeting the benchmark and not caught up in enough have they been making three months growth. And so that is some work I think we need to do around professional development to better leverage our universal screeners to ensure all kids are growing at a rate that we would expect. And if a student's below grade level, then we need to get, have them grow more than three months if we're ever gonna close the achievement gap. And so those scale scores, to me are, are way more important than the, the percentage proficient, but this is, that's how we should be analyzing it. This is for you to measure um, whether or not we're seeing more students grow and achieve at, at what we would expect the benchmark to be. Um, but I think we can incorporate scale scores as we move forward as well for cohorts. All right. Thank you both. Um, Andrew? Um, yeah, so with the feedback to the teachers and everything, the other um, place that I think feedback would be good would be to parents. Um, I know, you know, I've got kids in three different grades and some of them have shared the th STAR 360s and some haven't. So it'd be nice if there was just some consistency with that. And, you know, also getting the parents involved, knowing, you know, the more feedback the parents have, the more that they can hopefully be involved and help out with things too. Thank you. Anybody else? Um, Amy, it's Stacy. I just w I wanted to ask more broadly, and I I don't need a super detailed answer. And this is for you and John. Like, what the plan is to get some of those special ed kids up? Um, I know there's been a lot of conversation this year around establishing MTSS. I'm guessing that's the short answer. Um, but I'm just wondering, like, what that plan is that a three-year plan like what what is the duration of the plan and when do we anticipate getting some of those like lower tier numbers up where we think they should be Don I'll defer to you well again you know you, you talk about individual kids they have each each of them has an individual educational plan so they have a prescribed set of services that we provide them and then hopes of a, of a roadmap is to get them to the highest potential or to that ground level. So um, they are working on an even playing field with their peers, non-disabled peers. So, um, and then when you talk about the MTSS uh, uh, systems of support, uh, you know, we're moving away from that um, um, the discrepancy model a way to fail uh, to find supports for kids. So that MTSS is going to be very important so that we can study that and gather that data um, and get through that data to provide that support systems to kids who, you know, um, need it. Thank you. 
So I think it's it's going to be important to to really shore up our MTSS as in the coming years. I hope that Stacey answered part of your question anyway. Yeah, I mean, I, I guess kind of more generally, I know that it's a long game, and I'm just wondering when we think we can start to see the needle move. Yeah. Well, I'll jump in. I mean, I think we need to do more PD yeah. to see the needle move. So what we're looking to invest a great deal of our recovery fund efforts in is a strategic professional development plan. Um, and I think as our teachers become much deeper um, in content and experts in different areas, that we're going to see the needle move uh, quicker, Stacy. You know, the issue is, is I think that as we're beefing up our targeted intervention system so that we get students early intervention prior to them needing to get services via an IEP. It's also it's important to reflect back that when we didn't have that, essentially to qualify for an IEP, you're about two grade levels behind. Um, so that's significant. And so that means there's a great deal of work to do with to catch them up to, in order to get them back on grade level. Um, and when you look at another data point we've been monitoring um, is our percentage of students who are qualifying for IEP services um, and in certain districts, it's just too high. You know, the research shows about, you know, five, three to 5% of students have a specific learning disability and we've got buildings where we're close to 30%. That, that, that is about us strengthening our universal instruction. Thanks. I appreciate that. Thank you. Anything else? All right. Thanks, guys. Um, superintendent evaluation goals. So, does someone have something? What do you have up there, Jamie? Well, no, I did put them in my report for you guys so that you'd have access to them. Um, I, ha I have them. I can right them there. Out. Ray just popped them up. Do you see them, Kathy? They're on the screen now. Yep. Um, so the, the evaluation committee um, performed Jamie's evaluation. They sent out the surveys. The surveys came back. Um, along with Jamie, um, Sue from the VSBA, and the committee, we came up with five goals um, for Jamie for the twenty for the twenty twenty one school year. Um, and those are the goals. Can you guys all see them? Do you want me to read each of them out? Anybody have any questions? I'm not hearing any. All right, so do, um, do we need to accept the goals? Yeah, I think or you should. Yeah. So our, I move to accept a superintendent's goals for the 2020 2021 school year. Second. Second. Okay. Right. Is there any discussion on the goals? Sorry, who seconded that? Aaron. 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 Thanks, Aaron. All right, hearing no discussion. Um, uh, sorry, this is Don. Uh, what are what are going to be the parameters of evaluation of these goals? How are, how are they going to be demonstrated uh, effective? Uh, the the plan and the discussion was to have Jamie report back to the full board each month. Right, those are reports, but uh, are, are goals are goals designed to be. So the um, next year we'll perform an evaluation and we should be able to gauge off of this evaluation. Does that make sense? 
So, Don, are you looking for more specific, like, curriculum and coordination strategies so that the, they are this and this and this? Goal, goals are usually designed so there's benchmarks so they so can, that they can they be can measured. Demonstrate. Mm -hmm. Yes, correct. Good yes. point. Um, do we need a second go around with that? Well, or it's something that we could c continue on with our committee and we can set the, we have the goals and we can set the benchmarks for measuring it at another. Um, that, that, uh, either way, it just there, sh there should be some benchmarks to, to demonstrate yep. that goals are being achieved. That's all. Got you. I, Kathy, I think that's a good solution. Yeah, that so we we'll take just... that up. We have, you know, we we accept these now, and then with the caveat that we're going to come back with benchmarks after our next meeting. Yeah, and then that can be one of the things we report back on is how we're going to um, measure those. And then the the full board can approve those benchmarks if they feel like they're accurate or useful. Sounds good. Any other so, discussion? Yeah. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. That's okay. Any other discussion on the superintendent goals? If not, um, I'll go through the, the list and if you just say yay or nay, that would be great. So all those in favor, we're gonna do with Aaron. Yay. Um, Andrew. Yay. Carl. Yay. Tim Powell. Yay. Don. Yay. Ethan. Yay. Jennifer. Is Jennifer, that's a new name. I don't know all the new board members yet. Jennifer Brown? She's a public person, Kathy. Okay. I know we've got some new boards, so I didn't want to miss anybody. Lisa? Yay. Michael Gray? Yay. Shannon Cornelius? Yay. Stacy? Yay. And Kathy's a yay. And that was the unanimous vote, so so move. Thank you, everyone. All right. Um, school year calendar. Yeah, I know there's a long standing history to bring the calendar uh, to the board uh, to review and to approve. Um, the calendar and statute actually is not a board responsibility. Um, but I know it's a longstanding tradition, and I believe in traditions. It's, and uh, so I brought that this forward to you. The work of this calendar um, occurred via a uh, committee that was made up of principals um, and teachers. And the teaching staff and the principals were surveyed um, across the SU to gather feedback. There were two different options of the calendar. Um, and you can see that there's been added early release time to do our recovery plan efforts in the calendar this upcoming year, um, which I'm excited about, that we can gain momentum and continue to move the work forward as we look to talk about additional universal professional development. Um, our half days that you see, I've already collaborated with Carrie McDonald to ensure that there's actually going to be enrichment activities provided to students on those in service days, because we know in certain districts, we are adding um, some additional PD time um, from the prior year. And so we will make certain there's enrichment time provided for students, uh, much like we did when we had our early release um, at one o'clock when we first opened uh, due to COVID-19. Otherwise, the calendar is in alignment with our regional technical career center, which by statute has to be. Um, in regards to when we start, uh, our regular annual vacations, um, those all have to be in alignment with the Randolph Technical Career Center, and it is. Um, and so if you look, we are starting on the um, second, um, and uh, we will be ending um, on June 16th. And the other thing to keep as a caveat, I don't, it hasn't picked up a lot of traction in the legislature, but it was a proposal from Secretary French to have a statewide calendar. 
And so just know that even though we have this, that if the state, the legislature does approve that recommendation, then there would be a statewide calendar um, that would be implemented by the agency of education. Um, Don Shaw. Uh, Jamie, how many snow days are involved or are we using the um, remote learning in lieu of snow days? I didn't, so if you go down, Ray, by statute, we have to have 175 student days um, and we have 177 built in, but I would try to make certain that we did get 177 if possible, Don, unless it put us over to the following week of which I would come to the board and say that I would consider, you know, not bringing students back on the Monday, the 20th. Um, that we may just go like 176 if that was the case. Uh, but by statute, we have to go 175. The teachers, of course, would come back for PD if that was the case. I, I, and I thought in the contract, we added some days last year. Is that not reflected here? No, that's, here, that's something that we did not, we ended up not taking that up. That was something we, we left on the table. Hmm. Okay. Um, hi, Carol. Carl. Yeah. Um, hi, I wanted to follow up on the, 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 the snow day bit. Um, given all we've learned about how to uh, uh, administer uh, instruction uh, remotely, I'm wondering if we're going to be, you know, again, using that as a tool to, 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 to give us our maximum amount of PD days and our maximum amount of, uh, of student contact days by, you know, changing or, or modifying our snow day policy to maybe be, you know, one for you to play outside, one for you to work online, or or, or how we in, in, in intend to address that to, to maintain as many uh, student contact days as possible. Carl, I love that that um, recommendation. I think that's a solution to, to maybe meet the needs of all folks. Um, and I think I'm gonna survey folks again too um, after we get through the summer when folks are, you know, weren't as grumpy about moving to a remote day, because I definitely heard some negative feedback when we had done it. And I hope that maybe folks would be more open to that next year. Um, and we'll see what our families think um, about that idea. We can, you know, a, a thought might be to, 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 to move towards, you know, much like we, we like to do the 10, the, the 10 a.m. starts, so that the shortened day counts as a full school day when it's like icy in the morning. Um, if we could be, you know, thinking about ways to do that equivalent kind of reduced instruction or, you know, blizzard bag style kind of half play, half half work, especially for the, for our younger kiddos, instruction, so that we could be capturing at least some sort of learning. That would, that you know, you know, that would be awesome because at least one thing I've seen you know, in, in, in COVID times is, you know, this lack of, uh, you know, the, the more time we're in front of the kids, the better. Uh, Michael Gray. Uh, thanks, Kathy. Um, Jamie, I just had a quick question if, if and maybe you don't know yet, um, but if they did go to a statewide calendar, um, does that mess with our flexibility at all of like half days and and then I just know like Chelsea and Tunbridge like we usually take the Tunbridge Fair Day off and nobody else does like we would we still be able to do that kind of stuff or would we be like locked into a to like an overall thing? So half days we could do. I think we could put vacation day where we wanted potentially, but the what it's going to do is lock you in when we start. And it's going to lock us in when the larger traditional breaks are. So it would lock in when the Thanksgiving break happens, when the December, January break happens, and when the February, March break happens in April. That's more what they're after is continuity. Um, and I get it. We have a lot. I mean, in a lot of our sending districts, I know that folks are on different vacation schedules. Um, right now, right? So if I'm a student, if I'm a parent and I'm from uh, Granville Hancock and I have a student going over to Middlebury, a student coming over to Rochester, a student going up to Warren, 
I could be navigating um, pretty significant differences in the vacation calendar. I know that happens in Stockbridge as well with folks that go to uh, Woodstock and that come to uh, White River Valley. So I think that that's what they're hoping to, to better support is uh, statewide calendar in that area, Michael. Okay, cool, thank you. Shannon? Um, Hi. So, yeah, I was just responding to the SMART goals thing, um, which is just known as SMART goals. I think a lot of us in business have used them a million times, um, for better or worse. Um, but um, also, I, <laughs> the, the, using the blizzard bags, using the snow days, man, just... I, I got to say, I'm on the parent side. I am a parent. I work from home. There is something really magical about a snow day and taking that away when kids have had everything else taken from them sucks. And my son who's in second grade, who has a blizzard bag that takes him a half an hour and my son who's in seventh who gets stuck all day on a computer also sucks. So like, I, Jamie, there is going to be a parent revolt if we continue to take away the kids' snow days. I'm just putting that out there. <laughs> and I will be in the front because I hate doing that to my kids when there's a snow day. They should get to have the joy of a snow day. So that's me. We, we, we did adjust that, Shannon, based on yes. the feedback I received. Yeah. So. Thank you this year. Just, God forbid we go backwards. <laughs> I mean, I think there might be something worth it if we get to the amount of snow days where we're going to be running into not having enough days. You know what I mean? So may, maybe we allow so many snow days to happen. And then if we're like, okay, wait, we've had like a lot of snow days this year, maybe we need to be able to pivot and do something else so that we don't run into going to school in July. <laughs> we haven't had those years lately, but. <laughs> I don't know if you all notice, I hold out to the last minute. <laughs> hoping the roads get better. So the good news is we did only have three, but um, this year, and one of them I'm kicking myself for not having gone in the direction of a two hour delay. Ray's laughing. I felt cornered by a lot of my fellow soups um, in regards to that, but uh, I will continue to hold out um, as long as we can to make an informed decision. Nice. There's, there seems to be this momentum to calm the night before, and I get it too, uh, for planning a purposes but i also find that the media definitely plays up our storms nowadays um yeah. and so um i'll continue to wait and see what the road foreman across the su have to say before we make the call always blaming it on the media <laughs> stacy i'm a good friend of the media i know I'm i know you are friend. Well, in fairness, sometimes we think it's going to be not much. And what was the last one that wasn't going to be much? And we got like three feet. So <laughs> you never know. Blame it on Mother Nature. <laughs> um, all right. Enter, um, anything else on the calendar, guys? All right. Good. We will carry on to the Energy Committee. Can I just get you guys to take action, even though you don't have to by statute? You just have in the past. And I think it's good in the notes. I move that we accept the uh, calendar as presented by the administration, even though we don't have to. <laughs> Second it. I'm going to truncate that a little bit, Carl, if that's okay with you. Why don't you say we bless? bless yeah, I will. <laughs> Carl moves to bless the calendar. All right, guys. Um, all those in favor, say aye. 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 Uh, are there any nays? All right, hearing none, Jamie, you have a calendar. I'll get it up and I'll get it in my correspondence with families this week, because um, I know they're asking. So we'll get that out there. All right, thank you. Are you ready for the energy committee part? I am. Okay. So Don, uh, Don Shaw asked a question of Ray about where we're at with solar. And um, where we're at is, is that we realize that in general, there's solar, there's uh, looking at our, our regular annual consumption around additional other efficiencies, that an energy committee may make a great deal of sense in regards to public, board, students, 
teachers, admin who are really passionate about this work because we know we have them. Uh, I've also was really interested in how to increase student voice this way and get some students involved on the committee that's looking at energy. And so the idea would be is that this committee will meet monthly to work on some strategic planning, but to also vet the proposals that we've been receiving in regards to example of like solar and then be able to come to the board and have a proposal and inform the board's work around these areas. Um, and so the charge that um, I worked on with Ray is that the WRBSU Energy Committee is charged to research and gather information specific to energy efficiency proposals and projects that will increase energy efficiency of our member schools while also promoting fiscal responsibility. The WRVSU Energy Committee will report out monthly to the WRVSU board and provide recommendations and expertise when requested. Um, there's just a lot of work going on across the SU and it seems like this is an area that needs some focus. And my hope would be that this committee would provide that focus and support to move this work forward. Um, so my recommended makeup for the board would be two or three WRVSU students. We'd have two or three educators, three or four community members. There is an intermunicipal regional energy coordinator right now that's been hired um, by many towns in the, um, two, they call it the Two Rivers um, Regional Planning Commission is my sense is what that is. Um, and so he, his name is Jeff. Oh no, Ray, do you remember Jeff's last name? I knew it. But Jeff is currently funded, his position partly funded by Sharon and Strafford. And it sounds like that regional board is interested in him working with our schools. And so he will be of a service for us. Um, and this is the work that he does for many towns in the area. Um, and so he would serve on the committee as a real expert. Um, and then we would have one or two admin team members and two or three board members who have interest to make up this committee. Um, and what we suggested when we talked to Jeff, because he was a key member of the committee, um, one of the evenings that we currently have open, um, a standing opening is the, Ray, was it the second Thursday of the month, I believe? Jeff Martin. Thank you. And it would be <clears throat> the second Thursday of the month. The rest of the Thursdays will now have been taken by policy and negotiations. So this is the one Thursday that's left. Um, and as you know, we have standing meetings on Monday, Tuesdays, and Wednesdays. So um, that's that was our thought. And um, certainly open discussion and thoughts around it. The committee could always um, come back with additional feedback on the work. But, you know, when we have proposals coming to us by different solar companies and things of that nature, it seems like we need a coordinated effort. And what Jeff said is um, that there are towns currently right now working around a regional plan for energy efficiency and coordinating those efforts to make certain that they're getting the best deal um, across the member towns. So that was the thought process around it. All right, any other discussion on the energy committee? Oh, go ahead, Don. I would make a motion to empower the energy committee. As I would second that. All right. Is there any discussion on the formation of an energy committee? Okay. Hearing no discussion, all those in favor say aye. 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 Are there any nays? All right. Hearing done, we can move forward and form an energy committee. Thank you, Jamie. Yeah. If there's some board members, interested, please reach out to me. 
um, so I can get you on there. And Don, is that a yes? Awesome. All right. Just let me know. Um, and then we'll look to get a meeting warned and get to work um, on the second Thursday. I know Jeff's planning to attend. Um, and I think we've got some students that are excited to join as well. So we've got Stacey, to start. Stacey, were you saying you're interested? Yes, I can reach out to Jamie. Okay. All right, guys. Um, centralized food service, 2122. I know you guys just love me continuing to keep this on the agenda, but Make it I will happen. pick it up. Make I will happen. kick it off with, I don't know if you saw, but on Friday, there was a big to-do in Sharon at the elementary school. We had our meatloaf throw down, um, which was a ton of fun. And it was a tie, 51-51. And I will be hopefully learning from my mistakes um, in Sharon and headed to Chelsea for another meatloaf throwdown on Wednesday. <laughs> so we'll see if I can recover. <laughs> I must say making a pound and a half of meatloaf is very different than 20 pounds. Um, so that was the learning curve. So I'm hoping that I've perfected that for the <laughs> next go around. But it was a ton of fun. And we provided the all the students had the opportunity to engage in it um, and staff. And uh, you know I think that this is just a step to us trying to make certain that we're really promoting um, food and nutritious food. And so um, that was exciting. Yeah, no. Jamie in the past has been in events called the Iron Chef. So I don't know mm. if that's something that you want to re-, re uh, That's a great idea. Re go or not. And that was with students? Mm -hmm. That's what I thought. Yes, of course. Look at that. The grays aren't even showing up there. <laughs> Carl, did you have something? Yeah, I was gonna. I was also gonna piggyback on what Don said and echo, echo uh, Junior Iron Chef. But then also um, one of the things that we had a lot of success with in uh, 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 Stockbridge was the whole. You know, we had a, a community garden that the kids in the after school program worked on. And then we took vegetables, even though, you know, they were planting the vegetables, but we bought the vegetables that they were planting and, you know, came up with recipes and did, you know, there were competitive taste tests. And that really, really the kids, when you give them an opportunity to vote, when you give them an opportunity to take agency and advocate for, for, for you know, pro meat, pro vegetable, pro tomato, anti tomato, whatever it is. Just the engagement does a, a, a really great job of improving the idea of wellness and, and, and food awareness and just general, you know, we, we found that kids were eating better when uh, they were involved in developing the recipes or even just voting on the recipes. Nice. That, that's, that's great, Carl. And I know that again, um, I'm talking about Sharon a lot, but I know that Sharon's student council and student voice, they're that leadership coop that they've got going, um, that Keenan has been engaging them in surveys around the current selections and what students are enjoying, what they're not enjoying, so that we can use that feedback um, to make sure we're meeting our customers' needs, which is, you know, our kids. Um, and so, you know, there's, I think there's a great opportunity for us to capitalize on our, our um, food service workers' strengths um, and to just increase the bench when some of our standalone food service workers are out. One of the things they've been talking about already is that they're really excited that they could support each other um, in certain areas of the job um, if folks are absent. Um, and so that was great to hear them already start talking about that. Through my meetings with them and Tara's meetings with them, our food service folks, I think, um, are really in support around uh, centralizing. I think they're excited to learn from each other, to share those ideas like you just were, Carl, and try to make certain that we can create the best um, quality food and menu that best meets the needs of our students, while also still providing flexibility for what's special at each school. Um, 
And so that's what I've articulated in regards to the goals for them. You know, one of the things we got to wrestle with is this legislation, legis the legislature and the work that I think they're going to do in regards to legislation of providing free meals um, for all students. I do believe that's going to happen. Um, it sounds like there's going to be about a five year roll up um, before we have to implement that. The other thing that is good news is I was digging into ESSER 2 today, Tara. I think through some grant strategies, there's some ways to leverage some ESSER 2 money uh, to continue to support our food service program and to strengthen it. So that's good news um, to have some additional uh, revenue sources there. And the other thing is, is by doing this, the idea is that at the end of this next year, we will then retroactively assess out for the following year what we know is going to be a real subsidy for food service and the thought process behind that too just so you know would be a direct bill back on the cost it takes um, to assess out food service and so those are all the the strategies that we have to try to ensure that, that we don't have enterprise funds that are running deficits on an annual basis um, and that we'll have those numbers to then build into your local district budgets as an SU assessment, just like we do all other SU assessments moving forward. Okay. Jamie, do you want us to take action on this tonight? Yeah, I think I would love us to get this put um, behind us and start getting the work done to move us forward. All right. What does the motion need to look like? What are we approving here? The, the SU centralized food service, is that the basic? Yeah, plan? the motion would be that the food service management authorities would move under the WRVSU umbrella for the 21-22 school year. Um, and then, you know, I'll just remind the board that in statute, that is how we should be operating anyways. Um, and it's something that continues to get it does continue to be in our our audits with the agency of education. Mm -hmm. So I make a motion that the food service. Uh, wait, can you say it again, Jamie? <laughs> the food service of individual districts um, fall under the umbrella. What well, done? Go ahead. I was just going to say I haven't had a chance to talk with my principal to see what their thoughts and and feedback is so i i would feel uncomfortable making uh voting for it tonight that's just me i feel like i don't know i feel like i've talked about this a lot both with our our side and with the the executive board um so i don't know I, i'm I not aware I, of any administrators opposed to this um yeah. but you know i can't Keenan I mean, certainly hasn't spoke out opposed to it to me, Don. I don't know if he has to tear up, but. Uh, are we still ready for a motion, Kathy? Well, so, Go sorry. I, I just wanted to try, like, hearing what Don has to say, if we were to table this until next month so that everyone has a chance to make sure that their district administrators on board would be. That's well, we did. just did that this That's past what we month. Did that last, I mean, last it's meeting. been on every agenda for yeah. the last month. I, I just, I am going to okay. say that. Yeah. Okay. I feel like they need to, I, I think we need to, personally, I think we need to vote on it, you know, because it's been around for, I've, I've been to four different meetings where this has been talked about. Now. No, we've been talking about it for a long time. I just yeah, wanted to so make I, sure that. And I think it's going to hold them up longer. So, you know, if you don't, if you don't think it's time, vote against it. But uh, um, I'm ready to vote for this. And, um, and get it going. But I will make a motion that uh, food service be moved under the WRSVU umbrella for the 20, 2021, or is it, 20, is it 2021? 2122. 2122 school year. All right, so I'll do a roll call so we know. Uh, like well, wait, second. we don't even I'll have a second. second. I need a second. I'll, I'll second, second it and I have a discussion question. Okay, yeah. um, okay Carl, go ahead. So when we say we're rolling up food service under under the SU, um, are we making any um, caveats 
it, it's hard because I'm making I'm using hand gestures and I know my camera's off so I can actually hear right because my 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 computer my internet is crap right now. But um, are we making any kind of caveats about whether we're saying that we're bringing that under the the, the umbrella of the SU for a homegrown program that has a uh, a local food service director like Willie or or, or similar or or Bill um, that's directing. Um, you know, local union hired staff, or are we saying that we're, you know, moving towards a Cisco or an Airmark or some sort of program, or are we saying that we're going to look at both of those? This is homegrown staff. And when I shook my head, no, that was about, I don't plan to hire a food service director. Um, I want to approach this by a collaborative team effort. Um, where they're playing on each other's strengths and we're empowering our current food service folks to take on what they feel like they have expertise in. Um, and that's what we've discussed with them. So no, this is not a maneuver um, to go to a contracted food service provider. This is a way to try to find efficiencies here, homegrown and locally. And the associate business manager, that job description when you hired Jason, that person is supposed to be overseeing all things fiscal and direction of food service. Um, and so they'll take on a leadership role to help support that team effort. And we then maybe have, maybe have a friendly amendment that says we move that uh, we, we authorize the SU to, to move forward with developing a proposal for a, uh, a, uh, a locally uh, run food service program. Well, I, we, we've already developed a proposal, I, I, I think. Well, I'm just saying, I, I, I think, so Carl, you're, you're, you're feeling like we don't have an out if we don't like it. Is that sort of, I mean, because no, we are trusting them that they have a vision and they're going forward. I don't know if we can't detail all of right, the motion. Right. I, I, I was just thinking it'd be, it'd be better marketing, it'd be better for, you know, if, if people see that we're looking at doing um, SU wide food service, I, I, I worry that they'll say, okay, they're bringing in a Cisco or an Aramark and that having the word local or something like that somewhere in, in, in the motion might, you know, make people have a better vision of what we're trying to do. Sometimes we think we're more transparent than we actually are. Mm -hmm. Got you. So what would that be, Carl? What's, a, what's the amendment sound like? Um, well, Jamie, do you want to come up with it? I mean, because I think it's a good point what Carl's as far as selling this to people who don't want Well, I, I think that it's centralizing it with the understanding that we are going to be continue to run food service as locally, that it's not about contracting it out. All right, um, so let's say locally centralizing. You know, add the word locally in front of centralizing and and you know, at least that 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 that, that gives us the fact, you know, gives us the talking point. So to take over, um Stacy, what's what do we have right now? What is our motion? Read, please. Well, I'm kind of editing live. So now I have something like Ethan moves to move our locally centralized food service authority under the WRS WRVSU under W of ESU umbrella management or umbrella management management's a better word yeah for um, the 2021-2022 school year with the goal how about we say it with the goal to um uh unify unify the existing food service does that get somewhere there jamie Oh, we got Nicole, maybe. Yeah, she's that or with the understanding that the food service will remain local. Oh, that might do it. I think that does it. That's yeah. good. With the understanding the food service remains local. Nicole, you have I'm done with that. I, I am a public. Can I can I speak for two seconds? Yes. I it's gonna be very legal, but I think because you had a motion and you seconded that motion, you have to vote, and then you have to amend that motion. No. No, I, not, I, not, not, not motion. Not if it's, it's a friendly motion. motion. Not if it's a friendly amendment, Nicole? 
I know, but legally, I think you, because you have seconded the motion and you had a discussion, you need to now carry your vote but we on that motion. Closed this, we were still in discussion, which is a valid time to bring up an amendment Yep. when you're in the discussion time. I know, but don't you have to town, vote on- At the... town meeting, I know that's the way it works. I don't know about um, school board meetings. Okay. While you're in discussion is exactly when you bring in the amendment. Okay. Can Ethan retract it? Well, no, it's, no, Don, as I understand it, a friendly, amend, a friendly amendment has to be accepted by both the person that made the amendment and says it was a seconded amendment by the person that seconded the amendment. If they both agree, it does not have to be voted on and then re-voted as an amendment. It just has to be, you know, Ethan as the person who yep. made the amendment, and I think it was Shannon, I don't remember who seconded it. They both have to agree that adding that, that, that phraseology around locally sourced would solve the problem and then we're good to go to vote on it. Stacy, who seconded it? I had Carl down as a second, but Carl seems to disagree. Oh, <laughs> can, would anyone I, like to tell actually, me? actually, I think Carl and right. I did at the same time. So okay. Carl, I, I, have I, 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 I seconded Sorry. so I could immediately start talking. Good. Yeah. Sorry, Shannon, Stacey, Carl was could louder. You, could you, could you, um, I'm, I'm fine. I'm fine with the uh, friendly amendment as the person who, um, uh, could you read back what we have currently, please? I will. One second. And thank you for um, taking and notes. And actually, I, I think it's not quite there yet. Um, Ethan moves to move our centralized fluid service authority under the WRVSU management for the 2021-2022 school year with the understanding that our food service remains local. I feel like local doesn't mean very much right there. Um, locally staffed. Thank you. Oh, that's better. Okay. Ethan, is that Ethan and Carl? That's acceptable to me. Works for me. All right. So we're going to have a vote I'm, and I'll do roll call. So yes, all those please. in favor um, are going to say aye. Um, we have Aaron. Aye. Andrew. Aye. Carl. Aye. Chantel. Aye. Don. Aye. Ethan. Aye. Lisa McCrory. Aye. Michael Gray. Aye. Shannon. Aye. Stacy. Aye. Sue. Aye. Um, so everybody was an aye. Are there any nays? All right. Hearing none, so moved. All right, we'll get to work. Good work, Jamie. Good luck. All right. Indeed. Next is 1920 audit. Did everybody have a chance to look it over? Are there any questions? If there are none, are we ready to approve the 1920 audit? Just need to accept it, Kathy. You don't need to approve it. Um, accept it. This I is Don. I will make a... Oh, sorry, Carl. <laughs> no worries, Don. Uh, I move we accept the 1920 audit as presented with Don Shaw as a second. Correct. All right. Is there any discussion on the audit? All right. Hearing none, I'm going to do a roll call vote so we know the audit is accepted. All those in favor say aye. Aaron Dodder? Aye. Andrew? Aye. Carl? Aye. Chantel? Aye. Don? Aye. Ethan? Aye. Lisa? Aye. Michael Gray? Aye. Shannon? Aye. Stacy? Aye. Sue K? Aye. And I, Kathy, M and I. Are there any nays? Hearing none. The 1920 audit is accepted. Thank you all very much. All right. And is there any other? Whoops. Good work, Tara. You called it the 1920 audit, but you meant 2020 audit, I bet. 
No, it was the okay. 1920 audit. The 2019, yeah. 2020. Okay, I got it. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah, Failing on um, budgets. All right. Is there anything other for tonight? I you need had, an executive you, session. Yeah. Correct. Yep. <laughs> um, our next meeting date is going to be Monday, April 26th. Um, Carl? Yeah, I just wanted to, uh, we didn't have a board comment, but I wanted to uh, point out that uh, the um, RSUD uh, dissolution um, a vote that, that passed on, on the 19th, we received uh, information that we got over, we, they stopped with the petition when they got over 10%. There will be a reconsideration vote uh, for that uh, uh, dissolution going forward. Even may have more more notes or comments, but I wanted to make sure that that was, uh, you know, in the SU's mind. Okay, thank you. All right, so um, I need just board members for the executive session. I make a motion to enter executive session for a, a personnel, is it correct? Personnel, correct. Yes. I'll Do we need second. Second. No, don't, don't, uh, Ray can move us into a special thing now. Is good night, right? everyone. Good no, night. we'll all drop, jump off. Hey, we'll good night, off. everyone. Thank you all. Thank see you. you. I'll see some of you tomorrow night. <laughs> yes, good night. All right, guys. So do I have someone to make a motion? I'll make a motion that we um, that we authorize Kathy to make a offer to the superintendent on our behalf. Second. As discussed and or as agreed. Yes, as agreed in executive session. And all those in favor? Aye. 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 Any who's, opposed? I'm sorry, who seconded that? I don't know that there was a second in time. I'll second it. Thank you, Ethan. Thanks, Ethan. Mm -hmm. All right. Any discussion? Any more discussion tonight, guys? Nope. Entertain a motion to adjourn. All right. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Good night. Thank Aye. you, Kathy. All right. Thanks, guys. Have a good night.